Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for part two of our webinar series, Soil Health, A New Approach. I'm Hannah Dorn. I'm the marketing manager here at Ward Laboratories, and we'll do just a couple of brief intros and we'll get right into it. Um, first of all, please ask your questions in either the chat box or the Q&A box. Either one is fine. Um, if we don't get them all answered today, um, make sure to come back and join us for part three taking place exactly two weeks from now. Um, our panelists today are Willie Pretorius, Patrick Fries, and Zach Wright. Willie is our soil health consultant here at Ward Labs and brings a wealth of experience in soil health practices worldwide. Patrick Fries is also a soil scientist at Ward Labs and is defending his PhD in soil science. And Zach Wright owns and operates Living Soil Compost Lab LLC where he focuses on microscopy. So, Without further ado, um, in our previous presentation, we endeavored to provide some information on how nature functions uh, with respect to the provision of the freely available and abundant resources and how nature utilizes and these in stable ecosystems. Today, um, we're going to explain what scientifically based laboratory tests um, that we here at Ward Laboratories use and um, how to quantify some of those important processes with real data. Um, so again, we've got Willie, Patrick, and Zach. And with that, we'll jump right in. Do you guys wanna go ahead and share your slides? Oh, I might have to give you permission here. Okay, you should be able to do that now. <laughs> Okay, can you see that okay, Anna? And everyone? Yep, it yep. looks good to me. All right. So with our previous webinar, um, the three of you touched on the importance of energy capture. Can you explain the importance of this in the context of soil health and regenerative agriculture? Yes, Anna. Um, the, the energy which all living entities use to move, run, jump, etc is derived from the sun and captured through photosynthesis. The amount of energy captured and stored is thus directly related to the potential soil life activity as part of the captured energy is exuded in the form of high energy sugars that keep the soil microbiology active to perform their functions. So it's not only the zebras lines that rely on the sun captured energy, but also the below ground microbes. Natural photosynthesis captured energy drives the regenerative system and it is, should be there for every farmer's objective to capture as much of this as possible. Uh, Willie, can you briefly recap on the important mineral nutrients required for healthy plants and how these are incorporated into the system? Um, yes, let's start with carbon, which enters as CO2 from the atmosphere and incorporated through photosynthesis. Nitrogen enters as nitrogen gas through the soil. The top six inches of soil can contain two to three tons of, of non-plant available nitrogen gas per acre. And can, can be made available by nitrogen fixing bacteria, both legume associated or free living. All the other non-available mineral nutrients can be released and made plant available through microbial action, which will be described in more detail later. Water enters through infiltration and stored in, in, in the macro pores provided through aggregate stability or, or through aggregate, uh, aggregate stable pores and which we'll touch on the aggregate stability later in the, in the uh, webinar. Yes, absolutely. Um, Willie, since photosynthesis is so important, can you explain why and how this process can be measured? Uh, yes, this is, in, in my view, one of, the, one of the most underrated measured processes in agriculture, since it can provide a myriad of information, particularly as it relates to insect pest infestation, as well as providing an indication of the plant health. In this instance, anybody who wants to know more about this should Google Dr. Thomas Dijkstra, who provides detailed information on the brick threshold at which certain insects will be attracted or deflected. We stated that the capture of energy is an important process in, in BRICS measurement using a simple refractometer as an indication of how good this, this, this is being done. BRICS readings will also increase as your soil microbial community food source demand increases, drawing higher and higher sugar quantities 
from the, from the leaves. The rate of photosynthesis can be measured with a simple refractometer uh, from the sap squeezed from the crop leaves, and we encourage farmers to, to do this as a measurement for use in, in their management systems. Yeah, that's a, a very popular topic. Um, Willie, can you cast some light on the different forms of nitrogen within the soil nutrient pool? Okay, I think in order to, to get this explained, let's start with the relationship between soil organic matter as indicated in this uh, pyramid. Soil organic matter, carbon, soil organic nitrogen is in, in its different forms and how we measure this is very important plant nutrient. The important issue to understand here is that the bulk of nitrogen in nature is in the organic form, just to put this into perspective. And this is, this is illustrated in the, in the pyramid. If you have 3.7% organic material in your soil, you should through, through average measurements over the years have 2.1% soil organic carbon. A soil organic carbon is about 52% of the soil organic uh, matter component. A further deduction from this is that the so-called nature's ratio as first devised by Dr. Carl Albrecht of 100 to 10 to one for C to N to P would provide 0.21% nitrogen, 0.021% P in this example. In a laboratory situation, these measurements would be analyzed correctly and just, and this is just to provide a, a, a reference, a, a easy reference check. A, a further average measurement over several thousand samples indicated that the water extractable organic nitrogen in this in, is 1.1% is of the total organic, uh, uh, total organic nitrogen pool. To provide more accurate information, we have analytical methods to quantify these as shown in, in the slide. The pyramid is thus an illustration of the continual nutrient release into soil available forms from non-available forms through microbial decomposition from proteins to peptides to amino acids and indicating the laboratory tests used to quantify these different components uh, on this pyramid. Uh, pyramid provides a great visual. Yeah. I did forget to mention one thing. Uh, we do have about 30 minutes of presentation and then the rest will be for questions. So I see some coming in already, but just keep them coming and we'll get to them in just a few minutes. Um, okay, so we did talk a little bit about nitrogen. Patrick, can you elaborate on the different lab tests for the different nitrogen fractions? Yeah, so for nitrogen, we look at the solid mass uh, of the soil and then we, what we can extract the solutions. Um, the soil itself, as you can see on the left side, is uh, analyzed through a combustion method uh, or called a LECO, uh, where the entire sample uh, is combusted, a subsample, and then from that we can get total nitrogen and then also total carbon, but now we're just talking about uh, nitrogen. Um, and uh, that's uh, the entire pool, so organic and inorganic. Uh, and then from that, we move into some of the solution extractions that you see on the right side. Uh, the one that's presented on the right side is uh, the uh, water extractable, but uh, initially we can do what's called a KCL uh, potassium chloride extraction, which will give you the total uh, nitrate and ammonium, uh, which is the inorganic fraction. And you can subtract that from the total nitrogen that you get from the left side on the LECO, uh, and that will give you the organic uh, fraction. So then you can get all your different pools of uh, nitrogen from your soil analysis. Now related to soil health, uh, is the water extractable nitrogen, which is uh, depicted on the right side, and Willie will talk about a little bit. Um, and then for this, we take a subsample of soil and extract the organic uh, uh, nitrogen, the nitrate, and then the ammonium uh, nitrogen, uh, which is water extractable. Uh, that's typically uh, determined for a lot of soil health assessments um, and is uh, considered uh, the plant available fraction since it's water extractable. And remember from the soil organic matter, uh, there's roughly one to 3% uh, uh, nitrogen release annually. Uh, so you can factor this in uh, uh, to your soil analysis and your uh, fertilizer requirements. And uh, Willie can talk a little bit about some of the, the pools here, especially on the, the right side. Uh, can, I, can I just start by the, the, the nitrogen, uh, the, the total nitrogen in, in, in the soil organic matter form that is, that is in the, in the non-available uh, form that, that I've indicated on that uh, pyramid. We, we did ab about 68 uh, samples as a, as an, uh, through a survey. 
me measuring this and you can see that the average value on uh, over the 68 farms averaged about 3,075 3, 3, pounds per acre. The median was, was just under 3,000. The highest value was just over 6,000 and the lowest value was just under 500 pounds, uh, pounds per acre. So you'll agree with me that, that, that that's a considerable quantity. Uh, in the the distribution of the of the of the water soluble nit nitrogen uh, components in the in the uh, which is really the amino acid forms, um, in in nature that where where you have a stable environment the the dominant form is is organic uh, uh, amino acid in in, in in or different amino acids. And from from the from this uh, nitrogen or water extractable organic nitrogen profile, you can you can you can learn a lot in terms of, of, of the soil health of a of, of, of a particular sample. If it becomes less dominant with with more um, inorganic forms, you 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 will find that it's that that your soil health is is decreasing, and and that is also related to the ammonium to to nitrate uh, uh, relationship. The, the higher the ammonia and the lower the, the nitrates, the, the, the better the soil health. So just, just from the water extractable uh, uh, measurement that is, that, that is, that is indicated in, in this, uh, uh, on the slide, you can, you can really learn a lot from, from the soil health. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, so Patrick, you touched, about, touched on this just a little bit. Um, but we're often asked the question, how much nitrogen as a farmer do I actually need to put on? So what would be the best uh, kind of measures and methods to help a farmer understand that? Yes, yeah, so um, not including fertilizer, uh, the two main inputs uh, for nitrogen uh, that you want to consider are from biomass and then from organic matter. Uh, some of those are sort of related. I won't go into how those actually accumulate in those different materials. Um, but uh, as you can see from this table here on the right, uh, this is from managing cover crops profitability third edition from the from the SARE uh, uh, publication, which is really good um, uh, piece of material for cover crop uh, information. As you can see, there's a lot of nitrogen and other nutrients uh, that we don't have listed here. Mostly nitrogen, since that's what we're talking about, uh, available in the above ground biomass that we can take into consider for uh, consideration for the fertilizer requirement. Uh, these are total amounts of nitrogen in the biomass uh, for the various cover crops, um, which, is also, which is referenced in this material. And uh, uh, keep in mind, uh, uh, like I previously mentioned, that uh, there's a 1% to 3% mineralization rate uh, from organic matter, but you can uh, typically consider that uh, from uh, if you have a really healthy soil that uh, there's about a 50% release from the biomass and nitrogen uh, on an annual basis. Um, that again, depends on the health of the soil. So it's pretty easy to determine the inputs from the cover crop. Uh, you can use guides which are given online uh, to approximate uh, some of these values like I just showed you in the previous slide, some of the general concentrations, but it's way more accurate to actually analyze it yourself and uh, it's pretty easy to do actually. Uh, typically, there's a quadrant uh, of a known size, either you know, 25 to 50 centimeters or one meter by one meter. It's the square here in the above picture on the right. And you lay that down, you gather up all the biomass in that square, you put it in a uh, paper bag, not a plastic one, uh, because it will tend to mildew a little bit if it's moist uh, in a plastic bag. So you want to make sure it's pretty well aerated. Um, and then it's sent off to a lab for uh, macro and micro analysis. And again, the rest of the inputs, uh, aside from the ones that you quantify from the biomass, uh, are calculated from the actual organic matter, aside from the fertilizer inputs. Um, and uh, specifically the tests that I previously mentioned, including the mineralizable nitrogen from the soil organic matter, uh, because that's an, that's an annual release. So um, you have to take all these different things into consideration. Uh, and there's always uh, consultants and soil scientists, you know, especially here at Ward, uh, we have quite a number of them that can actually help you go over all these. I think what we what we're trying to achieve in this instance is to measure the uh, potential release from the below ground nitrogen and all the other uh, nutrients which we'll talk about 
And then what is the contribution from the cover crop that, that is planted that will, that will be decayed and release its nutrients and, 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 made available, and made plant available? So by putting these together in a, in, in, in a tabulated form, uh, you can give the farmer an idea of, of what his nitrogen credits are that he would not have to budget for in his fertilizer program. And any time we can save some money on fertilizer is a good thing, right? Particularly nitrogen at this stage of the game. Yes, yes. All right, so we've discussed carbon nitrogen and how these are measured. Um, Willie, can you tell us more about how the soil minerals are measured? Okay, in, in, in this respect, we, we, we have to distinguish between the mineral extraction with the standard solutions like MLX3, ammonium acetate, bray, and others uh, that measure the so-called available plant nutrients uh, and, and the total uh, total digestible minerals or the non-available form that could be regarded as the mineral reservoir. So the, the, let's not confuse the two. It is the, the conventional soil chemical analysis and, and, and the um, a total nutrient digest, which, which, in this in the, in, which in this instance will provide an indication of your, of your reservoir. Uh, in, in this slide, we, we, we provide information from a recent survey, once again, which included 68 farms from several states, showing this insoluble reservoir quantity to a depth of eight inches. And I'm sure you'll agree with me that this, that this, that, that this, that this quantity is, is substantial. Uh, but, but, but how do we get, the, get these in plant available forms? With, with microbial associate, association and uh, mycorrhizal connectivity. There are also other uh, mineral nutrients required in minute quantities, so-called nano and, and other um, micronutrients that, that are critical as coenzymes that synthesize vitamins, phytochemicals for animal, human, and, and animal and human health. And only through the connectivity with, with mycorrhiza can these nanonutrients be, be obtained. Uh, if you look at this table, you just spend a bit of time and look at the, at the quantities the average uh, phosphates, potassium, calcium, you can see that even, even the, 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 between the highest and the lowest range, the, these, these quantities are really, really substantial. And it is, it, it is there, they just need to be, meet, meet to be made available. So, so you can see what, where we are going with these, uh, with these soil health tests. We, we are trying to identify what nature provides free and how these how these are released and how we measure these in the in, in the laboratory this is the this is the context of these of, of these um, webinars which we are doing at present it's really quite an eye opening table too to see how many of those nutrients there really are in the soil um, and since you talked about mycorrhiza, but since that is so important, um, not only for soil health, but to assist with uh, accessing a mineral that is provided free of charge in the soil, how can we measure this process? Okay, um, you, you can measure the, the percentage colonization with, with microscopy, with, with microscopy techniques, which are very accurate, but time consuming and that's very costly. With this technique, the roots that contain vesicular abuscles and the roots in, in the roots, which is, is a structure within the root where the nutrient exchange takes place, is, is counted to achieve the percentage colonization. And we've, we've given you a picture at the bottom right hand to just show you what those abuscles look like, which have to be identified, and then the roots with, which contain them have to be counted in order to, to uh, calculate the percentage. There is, however, a, a method using the neutral the new, neutral fraction from the PLFA extraction that is that is very sensitive to to indi to this in indication of the uh, of these structures with, within the roots, and we, we have analyzed samples with increasing colonization percentages and correlated these with the root. Um, neutral lipid fat, fatty acid extraction measurements to obtain a relationship curve to provide with reasonable confidence an idea of the percentage colonization through the NLFA analysis. The relationship graph at, at the lower end is an illustration is illustrated in, in, in the slide. 
So by by doing a NLFA analysis of your of your root system, we can we can thus increase the number of samples which which we can which we can do on a on on, on a daily basis to to provide the uh, an indication of, of the colorization. Which is absolutely, in my view, one of, one of the most important analysis that, that needs to be done. Absolutely, um, and this is a, a great segue to talk more about soil microbiology and how we can measure these. Um, Patrick, can you lead us into that discussion? Yeah, I'll, I'll provide uh, something of an intro, I guess, because uh, I think Zach will probably have much more to say on this uh, this uh, area since it's his expertise, but. Uh, there are a few ways to get to soil microbiology. Um, three of the main ways uh, are, um, well, microscopy is what we just spoke about, uh, which is a sort of a tried and true method to uh, uh, sort of what they call morphologically or characterize uh, some of these uh, microbial groups with your, with your eye. Uh, the other two are CO2, 24-hour uh, CO2 respiration. And then the other one that we do here is the PLFA, the phospholipid fatty acid analysis. Um, soil respiration, uh, it's a very broad, non-targeted, uh, it's quantitative, but it's more qualitative in the sense that um, you get a sort of a broad understanding of the overall microbial activity uh, based on how much CO2 comes off of the soil. And what we do is we take a subsample of the soil, uh, we, uh, we sort of incubate it uh, in this little mason jar here, um, uh, with, we, we wet it uh, to field capacity, and then we incubate it in a, a warm environment for 24 hours. And then from that, we measure the CO2 that comes off of it. And then we relate that to an, uh, sort of a, a standard, I guess, in terms of a, a certain amount of activity in that soil. Um, the values are reported in parts per million of CO2. Um, and so we, we just give you kind of a, a guide as to what that value means. It's pretty good. I'd say if you are all working on a budget, but you want to get some microbial activity, un, you know, uh, understanding or assessment done, this is a pretty good broad uh, approach. The other one, which is much more targeted, uh, is the PLFA, the phospholipid fatty acid analysis. Uh, this one's very targeted. Uh, it uses a series of uh, solvent extractions. It's about a two-day extraction process on top of a few days of prep to prep the soil. Um, and it targets the lipid, the phospholipid portion of the microbial cell wall that you see in red here, the little diagram. Um, these uh, cell walls are, uh, the lipids in the cell walls are specific to certain microbial groups. They're also called biomarkers. Uh, they're extracted and quantified using a gas chrom uh, chromatograph. And it'll give you a breakdown of uh, the bacterial and fungal communities, the gram positive, the gram negative, uh, the saprophytes and mycorrhizae, uh, actinomyces, uh, the rhizobia bacteria, protozoa, uh, and then you get a total microbial biomass. Now there is a portion of that that is not differentiated, uh, meaning that we don't really know what it is, but we can say it is a microbial related or sourced lipid that we're extracting. It's just, we don't have biomarkers for those, but you still get uh, very specific information from this analysis. And then from this single analysis, this is where we pull out uh, the, what we just spoke about, the NLFA that's related to the root colonization, the neutral lipid fatty acid, it comes out in this exact same analysis. It's just one of the extracts that we pull out when we do PLFA. So it's, you know, we can get it all in one go. If I can just say something about the uh, CO2 measurement. You must remember that uh, nature decomposes and nature recomposes. And in this uh, with the CO2 measurement, we are, we, are, we are measuring a combination of the decomposition and the recomposition microbial active process. Absolutely. Um, Patrick, you talk about the targeted approach here. Um, can, you, can you just elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, I'll touch on that just a little bit more. Uh, I'll let... Uh, Zach uh, pick up the rest of it <laughs> because it's more of his area of expertise uh, in terms of like the, the whole community analysis. Um, but here on the left side, uh, you see uh, the, this is uh, this is from a, a sample report, right? A, kind of a targeted breakdown of everything that we can pull out of the PLFA. Uh, it gives you quite a bit of information, but the, at the top part you see in uh, the, the top of the uh, cell, I guess, is the total microbial biomass. That's what we're, we're kind of starting with. 
From there, we can break everything down in terms of the saprophytes, uh, protozoa, gram positive, gram negative, like I said, and everything marked in red on this on the right side of the soil food web um, is uh, everything that we can actually target. You can see the things that aren't marked in red are things that we're still trying to figure out how to target with this analysis uh, or with more tried and true methods, uh, I guess I, I should say traditional methods um, like microscopy. And I can let Zach uh, kind of talk about that a little bit. If I can just, uh, be, before, be, before Zach jumps in, um, the soil food web at this stage, in, in my view, has uh, two deficiencies. We cannot identify the broker or the different protozoa species. And we have no biomarkers for the for the nematodes. Um, the and the nematodes are becoming a very important uh, part. Of the, they play a significant role within the within the soil food web, particularly when when it comes to uh, uh, nutrient cycling. And then obviously the the uh, you can gather a lot of information if you knew what the what what the different different ratios of your flagellates to movers to ciliates are because that, that that usually gives you an indication of whether they of how well a soil is is aerated and how well it's functioning and but but I think Zach Zach is the expert on on, on, on that topic. Yeah, so I offer a qualitative analysis, so and that's through direct microscopy. So I'm literally taking a soil or a compost or manure source, I'm diluting it with distilled water, and I'm putting it on a slide, and then basically spreading that slide out and just looking at what's there. Uh, and looking at what's there, I am looking for the functional organism groups, or in other words, kind of the bottom four rungs of our food chain, um, also known as a food web. So in looking at soils throughout the, the country um, quite regularly, uh, what is largely missing from our production soils are your larger organisms, those protozoa species and even the nematode species as well. Um, so in this slide right here, um, these are just a few of the highlights. Um, on that top row of three pictures, we have our protozoa. Um, we characterize, um, in my, I guess, the way I analyze soil, we, we group those into um, two different classes, your amoeba and your flagellates, they're on the outside. Those are your aerobic organisms, aerobic indicating organisms. So we use them as a kind of a biomarker in itself to kind of indicate what the larger ecosystem of that specific sample looks like. And those would be aerobic organisms. Now the ciliates in the middle, those are typically your organisms that start showing up when we start lacking oxygen in the overall ecosystem. Ciliates themselves, as I explained to many farmers, are not bad. These are not necessarily pathogenic organisms. However, when they show up, we know that we have anaerobic organisms present because that's the ciliates flavor. Um, so protozoa, highly, highly, highly beneficial organisms to get back into our system, not only on a physical, level because they're so much bigger and they're physically moving the soil apart and micro aggregating and macro aggregating as they do so, but they're also unlocking the fertility that are embedded in our bacteria, which are largely at the bottom of all soil food chains. So that's probably all I will say, I guess, right now on protozoa, but the, through active uh, microscopy, I can characterize the organisms in those three groups. And I actually teach farmers how to do that themselves as well, because it's very easy. It just takes somebody to show you these organisms uh, live, um, but that's not for everybody. So in the bottom category, we have nematodes. So nematodes have gotten a pretty bad rap over the years because there are such thing as pathogenic, parasitic, I should say, nematodes. Now, parasite means it eats living things, living plants. That's why we can have a parasitic nematode come in and wipe out a monoculture. However, I think grossly speaking, and I'm not a nematologist at all, um, I think largely speaking, most of our nematodes in our soils are beneficial. And I help farmers not only identify whether or not their nematodes in their soil are beneficial or potentially non-beneficial, but I also help farmers actually raise and cultivate those organisms through really good aerobic composting, because we're trying to put back all of these organisms back into our food systems. So nematodes, I would say, largely fall in that kind of third rung of the food web. We have bacterial feeding nematodes, we have fungi that eat, or we have nematodes that eat fungi. 
We have nematodes that eat other nematodes. You can actually purchase some of these, what we call predatory nematodes, and you can put those into your system to actually uh, eat things such as insect eggs, uh, bad nematodes. I've seen these predatory nematodes in their individual species actually deployed and used in soil systems and, con and they actually control the things that are harming our system. So um, vast, vast worlds right before our eyes right here that exist microscopically in the soil. Um, and they're very much part of our food web that we're trying to not only analyze and quantify, but we're also wanting to uh, repopulate this into our system because ultimately, like we started this presentation with, photosynthesis creates the ultimate dry, it's the ultimate food that goes through this system. These are the organisms that help cycle it back up to the plant. It's fascinating to see these slides and, and to actually visualize what some of these microorganisms do and what they look like. Um, excited yeah. to, to talk more about that. Yeah, that nematode in the center there, that, that's actually not the type of microscopy that I would be using. The five pictures okay. on the outside, um, I wish I had an electron um, microscope, uh, maybe someday, uh, not in the budget yet, but we actually have fungi. So as you see in that picture there, there are fungi that actually have hyphal rings, right? And they produce an enzyme inside that ring that attracts certain nematodes into that ring, like you see in this picture here. And that fungi is actually snaring that nematode and it's gonna then digest it and eat it and um, release all of that wonderful nutrients of the, that the nematode has obviously eaten. So a uh, vast underworld right before our feet. And we're just starting to finally, I guess, realize its place in production agriculture. Absolutely, that is fascinating. All right, so we've talked about the chemical um, components, we've talked about the biological, and now we've got the physical left. So we've not talked about um, aggregate stability in depth yet. Uh, Patrick, can you give us some ideas of how we do these analyses? Yeah, so um, soil aggregate stability measures uh, just that. Um, it's uh, how likely a soil aggregate, which is held together by the microbial um, and plant exudates and some of these microbe-based glues, the minerals and the organic molecules, uh, how likely it is to break apart in water. Um, the stable soil aggregates uh, are, are the end product of a healthy, productive soil, uh, and they directly correlate with the water infiltration and holding capacity. Um, this test is probably one of the most important. I would say that relates to regenerative ag because that stable, healthy aggregate is sort of the end product of that whole process of not touching the soil, letting the soil kind of, you know, uh, do its function, that whole energy transfer that we were discussing earlier from the chemical, the physical, and the, and the microbial communities or the aspects of it working together. Um, the aggregate stability is determined uh, between the two and one millimeter fractions, uh, either with a dispersion agent, agent or just water. Uh, we do both, but our modified one uses just water. Uh, the amount of particles dispersed in solution is compared to what stays on the aggregate, which is reported as a percentage. Um, and you can see here on the right, uh, these uh, three uh, sieves uh, with that two to one millimeter fraction. Uh, you can see that with the uh, meadow soil in the middle and then the forest soil, which are essentially uh, undisturbed, they have a higher portion of stable aggregates versus the tilled soil. Uh, it's that physical disruption of the soil that kind of breaks up those aggregates, those glues, and sort of disrupts that whole microbial community uh, and their whole work to kind of form that ag aggregate, that stable aggregate. Um, and then the water inf infiltration tests you see on the left, um, they're typically determined using what's called an infiltrometer, but you can use a tube uh, or something that, you know, you can actually visually see the water infiltrating the soil. It's stuck into the soil and water's added. Uh, and then you can kind of measure the infiltration amount with time and that gives you the infiltration rate. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, that's pretty much everything I can say about this one, but I don't know if you wanna speak more to this one. Yeah, I think it's just the, 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 the on-farm uh, soil infiltration measurement, is, it, it, it's, it's vital because you, water is probably the, the most uh, limiting or it, 
without water, you cannot you, you cannot grow crops. So th this whole thing, uh, or the, the the measurement of, uh, of of water infiltration and the agri aggregate stability is extremely important because what what you what rains you need to inf everything that rains or all the rain that falls you need to have, you, you need to have the potential to infiltrate it and store it and you can only do that with a proper aggregated soil which is which is built over over time with with, with the microbial communities as we've described and it improves your 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 soil health uh, and that is also a a, has a relationship with the, with, the, with the stable carbon. So all of this fits into a, into a holistic system that, that, that nature, that nature uh, generates in order to survive and, 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 and create stable, stable ecosystems. And that's, that's what regenerative farming is all about, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to use the, the, the nature's resources to, to uh, and, 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 and create an, an, a stable ecosystem with, 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 with on your farm. Yes, and, and aggregate stability is something we do here in our lab and it's something that we feel so strongly about that we're actually including it in our soil health assessment um, as well. Um, and that takes us into uh, kind of the next slide. Willie, can you summarize some of the soil health tests that we've talked about? Yeah, this is a, excuse, but this is quite a busy slide and I know I had resistance to, to put it in, but I think, and, and, and I just want to, for the, for the viewers, just to get yourself acquainted. I've, I've done this uh, in, in the form of a progression from a simple soil respiration test and pulling it to the to more complex PLFA and, and other tests. Uh, the slide is very busy, as you can see, but if you start at the bottom left, left corner and move to the right, you'll, you'll follow how the test progressively provides more and more soil health, soil health in information. So you can actually build your own uh, soil health uh, packages as you, as, as you want. And, and, and these, are, these are all available at, 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 our, uh, at, at our laboratory in, in, in you can do the you can do simple ones you can and you can do and, and you can do all of them, um, but this is this is the, this is the way we see the progression from a very simple I just want to know do I have life in my soil to yes I have a life and what life I have and how is it how, how what 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 does the life look like does it does it fulfill the 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 requirements of, of the soil food web. Uh, do I have mycorrhiza? Is, is, is my mycorrhiza connected? So and so, so you, you build it up from, from a very simple just do I have life and what does a life look like and will the life provide and make available the, the, the resources that, that, that nature provides. Can we provide the slide on the website? Uh, yeah, we can do that. It's a little bit, uh, you, might, you might need some more time to kind of sit with it, but it is really good the way yes. you can follow it from the left to the right. Kind of gives yes. it a bit of a breakdown as you go up. Yes. And then even beyond um, just what's on here is also reaching out to Zach and talking more about um, actually what's in there. This is great. I, I love this. I, I'm actually recommending a lot of people do these analysis just because it's just good to have a baseline. You know, whether they're ward customers currently or they're just looking to really get that fundamental understanding of where they're starting from. Um, mm -hmm. This is fantastic. This is so comprehensive. I really like how this is laid out. I'll probably carry this sort of print out with me too. Yeah. Awesome. But we don't get right. finished. There's still more to come. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're about to wrap up with our slides. Um, Patrick, there, there, there's one more. Uh, yep. Yep. Do you have just a, a summary for us here of, of some of the new soil uh, health tests? Yeah, this is uh, <laughs> this one's a busy one too, but again, we'll provide it as a reference. But just touching on some of these uh, here on the left uh, that are sort of added towards the um, uh, soil kind of life assessment or carbon assessments in the soil. So uh, we here we have included soil enzymes, uh, the poxy, uh, ACE protein, and the NLFA, which is what really went over uh, in detail previously. The soil enzymes are sort of just uh, metabolic markers for. Uh, these enzymes that bacteria uh, and uh, these microbial communities exude 
to sort of release some of these nutrients that plants will then take up and they're sulfur based, phosphorus based, carbon based. The, the, there's a slew of enzymes you can target. It gives you kind of a, a metabolic snapshot of how active the microbes are in the soil, uh, which gives you an indication of the health as a whole uh, because they should be actively uh, metabolizing a lot of these carbon groups and sort of releasing a lot of these nutrients. And I think we're uh, looking at adding more to this analysis currently. Uh, the POC-C is the, uh, here, the permanganate oxidizable carbon, which is the active carbon, uh, the, the really easily accessible carbon fraction. And uh, from the opposite side of that, so if you can determine what's accessible and really active, on the other end of that, you can actually determine what's stable. Um, so from this analysis, you can get both sides of that, that coin. Um, and it's a huge part of uh, a lot of these soil health assessments that many people incorporate, it gives you that sort of active carbon fraction. And then ACE protein is the uh, autoclaved citrate extractable protein, which is primarily related to uh, the organic nitrogen pool. Some people call it mineralizable nitrogen, but it really correlates with uh, the total organic nitrogen a bit better. Um, and it's a very stable part of the, the, the proteins in the soil because you use uh, uh, heat and pressure to release it from the soil. So you can imagine it has to be quite stable. Uh, but that is related to uh, a lot of the, the total carbon as a whole. So things like manures will help build up these proteins, uh, a lot of organic inputs. So those are just some of the things. And then the NLFA, the neutral lipid fatty acid that really dis discussed earlier that targets plant roots and the percent colonization of a lot of those microbial communities that help facilitate that nutrient release and uptake into the plants. And more to come, right? More to come. There's always more that we're putting on the plate. Absolutely. Uh, so that wraps up our slides, correct? Yep. Okay. So now I'll be done asking the questions and we've had quite a few good ones trickle in here. So we'll just head right into that and try and get as, as many of these answered as we can. Um, okay, first one, is there a national soil testing certification process that can be relied upon to understand sensitivity of labs to help quantify soil organic carbon inventory? You mean like a certified lab uh, repository? I think so. Could you possibly just repeat that question, Anna? Yes, yes, it's a long one. Uh, is there a national soil testing certification process that can be relied upon to understand sensitivity of labs to help quantify soil organic carbon inventory? Um, I could possibly start by, by saying that um, the, we are in the process of, of, of working with um, I just can't remember his name now. Uh, there's a number of labs working together, and 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 so there's a there's an interlaboratory exchange of, of of information starting to take place to see where to see where where the where the differences are in the in in the measuring processes, uh, and and in order to um, get a a standard uh, procedure for each one of these analyses. Uh, going so, so that we so, so that there's actually a standard operating procedure for each one of these, and then these labs will then collaborate with with, with each other and see and, and, and to see whether whether there's uh, whether there's uh, with the, what the differences are in the in, in, in the analysis of a particular sample that everyone will will, will analyze. So yes, there the, 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 the is a beginning of of that starting to take place. I guess it's the proficiency testing That's network. Right. Yep. Yeah. So I guess if they look for that kind of because I think we advertise that on our website as well that we are part of the proficiency testing network, yes. um, which is sort of yeah like you said like the the, the standardized approach to soils. And, and I, I think I know where this question is coming from uh, because there's there's so much interest in the in, in the carbon credits, uh, and it and it is a completely un unstandardized uh, methodology that's that's being followed at the moment. There, there is no there is no standard, uh, uh, for, particularly for the for the for the carbon sequestration. Yes, we can we can measure carbon. We can measure very different many different fractions. But we need to set set up a protocol for the for the for the carbon credit uh, anal analysis methods, and that is that that is not easy. 
Okay, let's move on to another one. Here's a good one. Um, is the water extractable nitrogen the only plant usable form of nitrogen in the soil profile? No. Or can the other forms coming from the combustible test also, are they also plant available? Well, in, in the, the, your, your plant available forms are amino acids, which is water extractable, uh, nitrates and, and, and ammonia. Um, so yes, I would, I would, I would, I would concur that that uh, that nitrogen water extractable nitrogen profile would be an indication of of most of the nitrogen that is that, that is available. There could be other forms, but um, uh, of, of of significance uh, that that is measured at the moment are the uh, the amino acids, uh, ammonia, and and, and and nitrates. And the and, and just interesting there is. There's about 54 different amino acids or amino acid type uh, compounds being identified as, as, as plant available. Yeah, there's also the KCL extract that we do for, which is sort of like the total inorganic pool. Um, oh. And the water extractable is sort of like what's readily available, available of that pool. So if you do uh, like your standard KCL extract, potassium chloride for nitrate and ammonium, a lot of that's kind of stuck in the soil. It might not be readily pulled off with water. So that's just different ways to kind of look at some of those different pools. But it needs to be water, uh, um, water, water soluble to, 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 to be available to the, to the plant roots. Because it, it, it's either available to the plant roots or to the, or to the uh, soil microbes uh, that's, that, that's within the um, rhizosphere of the, of the roots. And I guess, generally speaking and biologically speaking, I personally would look at protozoa. You know, if you had, you know, looking at your protozoa content from your PLFA test, I have to say it slow, um, that's going to also indicate some nitrogen availability as well as many other nutrients through just that, you know, that biological mechanism of nutrient cycling up the food stream. So that kind of how I would interpret it biologically um, in addition to what we just talked about. Yeah, but even, even, the, even when, when it is cycled through the, through the predation process, it is released into the pool either as, 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 as uh, uh, amino acids or as, as, as mainly as, as, as ammonia. And not readily available like nitrate that would be pulsing our... Nitrate is really a part of the, in nature, a part of the isomerization process where nitrogen is actually forced out as a component with, 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 within the cycle. Okay. It is the least, it is the least wanted yes. uh, nutrient in, in, in a, a natural stable system. Yep. Okay, we'll move on to the next one. Um, here's an interesting one. It seems like soil health tests are mainly about the topsoil or topsoil horizon. Can you talk more about the subsoil in terms of drainage and compaction and how we can access those potential soil limitations? Deeper roots. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. Deeper, deeper roots and then deeper soil analysis. A lot of people will do that for residual nitrate analysis and the soil will go down to 24 inches. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's that, it's that rooting system, I think, the deep rooting system and that whole network, I think that really kind of um, uh, helps provide the access to that, that kind of uh, residual nutrient pool. You will find that um, as your soil health uh, measurements and as your soil health in, in, in practice improves, you'll find that, that you, you, you will have a carbon sequestration forming deeper and deeper and deeper into the soils as you form more aggregates down the, down the soil profile. So ultimately, your, your uh, uh, area or reservoir from where your roots can, from where your roots and microbial in, uh, uh, in association with the roots can obtain their, their nutrients from, from the reservoirs increases as you go down deeper and that can only be only be done with with improved soil health and you can see that that it goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper down, down the down the uh, soil profile uh, 
Uh, Christine Jones has, uh, has, uh, has and, 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 and I have that, that picture where she in Australia indicates a, a regeneratively grazed uh, land versus a non-regeneratively grazed land and how the, how the, how the depth of, of just of, of color of, of organic matter increases as you, as you progress down the, down the uh, profile in, in, in to, to deeper levels. Whereas in the uh, conventionally grazed, there, there, is, there is nothing happening. It's only, it's only confined to the top six, to, to, to the top few inches. I've, I've observed that in a lot of root digs where we're digging down 48 plus inches into the soil and you can almost track, it's like the, the top soil actually gets pulled down by the roots itself when you've got that biological colonization and activity. It's a beautiful site. That's how it gets deep, you know? The microbes. And, and obviously, as I mean, if you, if you just look at the uh, total nutrient digest, which, we, which yeah. we've indicated in the top eight inches, what is available, as you go deeper, you you know that that, that that quantity just doubles and quadruples. Yes. So you, you you your resources actually become more and more and more as you as you uh, and I don't want to use the word mine as you mine deeper in, into the soil because this is not a mining process. This is, this this must not be confused with the mining process and that, that is that that is sometimes uh, um, related to you mining your soil. You're not mining your soil with if you if you have it microbial assisted. And I would say if you're if you're uh, thinking you might have a heart pan or some compaction issues, so I think the question also included uh, bulk density that you should at least go down a few feet uh, until you can kind of get an approximation of any potential heart pan, especially if it's been historically tilled soil or if the calcium is really high. Those two things kind of go towards uh, heart pan development. Um, and then you can kind of go from there to see, you know, if you want to switch to no-till, you know, the keep keeping an eye on that, several years of monitoring in terms of uh, how well that hard pan is being broken up by the root system. Okay, this one is for Zach. Have you accumulated a database of these assays that you have done over the years? No. Nope. Question. Okay. No. Nope. I mean, I've got probably close to, I mean, at least a thousand. But as far as re-aggregating that data, no, I'm not a Excel whizzy bang. Um, there's, a, there's other people, and I would highly encourage you to uh, look at Dr. Elaine Ingham's work. Um, she's kind of the founder of the Soil Food Web. Um, I guess the packaging, the theory, and all of that of it. Uh, one of my original teachers, a uh, person who taught me how to do the qualitative and slash quantitative analysis that I do. Um, I'm happy to share with you, I guess, the years of experience of looking at different systems directly, um, but I'm largely an educator and teaching other people how to do that and other people how to use the tool that is the microscope. All right. Um, when you do all the tests for soil analysis, are they the same test for substrates or the analysis or sample submission change? Does that make sense? So the, what was the, what's the second part of that again? Um, is it the same tests for substrates or the analysis or sample submission change? So I'm, I'm almost wondering if they're asking if one sample will suffice. Oh yeah, if we can pull it all from one sample. Yeah, I think, oh, oh, I, think, yeah. I think he's saying is, is, is one sample sufficient to cover all the tests that we, that we have? I think is, is, is that what he's saying? Yeah, I, I, think, I believe I, so. I, so. So long as we get Get sufficient uh, size sample, mm -hmm. and and and, and uh, people must uh, farmers must try and uh, make a a a a, um, a compendium of, of of other words. They, they must stratify the 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 sample taking so they so they cover a whole area with with you know with, with a sample that is that is from a pretty pretty well. Uh, similar similar kind of soil with, with within the lands which they which they which they want the which they want the results for. It's no good just sending us one one sample from you know that that's that's drawn from a from a uh, sample within the soil. We need a a stratified sample, and uh, I, I think doc, Dr. Ray will will talk more, more about this in, in 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 the next presentation. I would say if it's, there's some uh, some microbial aspects to it, they need to make sure that that. It's very sensitive to like temperature and time and shipping of the soil. So 
if they want if they want some heavy microbial work done, um, it should be at least cold shipped or shipped ASAP, um, uh, handled a bit more delicately. But we can pull everything if they send enough enough soil. Uh, it's usually like a sandwich size bag, pretty full. Uh, we can do a pretty good suite of analysis on that. Okay, we've got about five minutes left. Um, Patrick, Willie, and Zach, are you okay if I share your contact info in the chat with everyone? Sure. Okay, we'll try and get to a couple more questions, but I do see some, some fairly specific ones. So feel free to contact these guys. Um, you can either call the lab or shoot them an email to talk more if we didn't get to your question today. Um, we'll try and get through at least one or two more here. Um, how does clay contact, excuse me, how does clay content affect the water aggregate stability test? How do you interpret this test for high clay content soils, greater than 40% clay? Um, I think that's for you. I think it's, that's not my area. Yeah, it's, um, well, the, the clays add to the aggregation, uh, specifically with some of the chemical properties surrounding the clays. Um, but Fundamentally, if you have a, um, a high clay soil, as long as the, um, I guess the glues and the exudates and everything uh, that are sort of holding those together, uh, you should see a higher portion of aggregation because those smaller parts are gonna be held together. Now the sand fraction, uh, it doesn't really hold that together that well. And uh, the, the sort of aggregate as a whole, if it's a sandier soil, it, it's kind of, it's harder to make those stable aggregates. Um, but they are still part of the aggregates because they have typically higher porosity. Uh, I guess not maybe not higher porosity, but they have higher pore space, I guess I should say. Um, so uh, you should see if you have a higher clay content, as long as the glues are there, uh, you should have a higher aggregate uh, sort of stable fraction uh, compared to something like a sandier soil. Okay. Um, next question, when is the best time to take a BRICS measurement? At the same time of day. And I, I, if I could just interject, because I use a refractometer a lot with producers directly in the field, it is a real time kind of insight into your plant's immune system. So the first thing is, is if you're going to do refractometer readings, have a little notebook, pocket notebook, so you can write time, you can write field, you can keep notes, you have to track what you're doing. Um, and I might be incorrect on this, but I've always been under the, 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 the school of thought that your highest bricks of the day is going to be in the PMs, 5 PM to 8 PM, and your lowest bricks of the day should be between 5 AM and 8 AM. And I say should be because our plant is going to translocate many of its sugars and its foods out of its root systems overnight um, as a part of its natural translocation, um, the mechanism of the plant. So what we should see is we should see a much less uh, bricks reading in the morning than in the previous evening. And I think it's actually 70% is regarded as that, that optimal health of, we should see a brick score that's 70% less in the morning than it was the previous evening. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll concur with that. Uh, I don't think we can, I can improve on that. But. Is it uh, is it primarily a leaf or a fruit? And I've done it on like onions before. I've never done it on leaf analysis. Leaf analysis. Always, I always go to the, the nutrient pools. So the, the freshest leaf, or if we do have a flower or a fruit, looking at that too, the, you know, when we've, um, when after tassel and corn, looking at the uh, ear leaf, the leaf above the ear of corn, and then also looking at the kernels themselves where we wanna see more sugar obviously going into the grain than in the leaf. Okay. Hmm. So kind of variant, it depends on the crop, but using it, it's crazy. I went to a viticulture conference so many years ago and nobody had ever thought about using it on their leaves, on their grapes. I mean, they use it, you know, when yeah. they use it on their grapes to pick their grapes, but it's like, wow, it was a whole different concept to think, wow, I could actually look at my leaves too earlier on. So yeah, very Washington State, I, Yeah, in Washington State, I only did it on onions. So that was the okay. mad wine there too, so. Yeah. <laughs> I think that brings up an interesting point too with any of these components that we're measuring. It is important, especially with the biological to, to test at the same time um, every year and every season um, so that you're really getting an apples to apples comparison and and can really track progress over time. So uh, that, that kind of idea of same time translates to really all the tests we've talked about today. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, well, with that, it is one o'clock. Um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time, but again, um, feel free to, to grab that contact information out of the chat. Um, we've got one more webinar coming up in two weeks on Tuesday, the, I think it's the 29th or 26th, 26th. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all there. So thanks everyone and have a great day. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Okay.